Henceforth walk not as Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding uh, darkened, being alienated from the life of God, to the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Amen. I titled the message today, The Effects of Keeping Unity. The Effects of Keeping Unity. Unity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you and praise you for all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you for each one that's here today. Lord, we do pray that you would uh, meet with us here, and Lord, that you would stir our hearts, and Lord, that you would help us to realize the importance of having unity. Lord, without it, uh, you know, businesses would fail, marriages would crumble, churches would disband. So, Lord, we're asking that you would help us here tonight, uh, today, Lord, and help us to understand what is said. Lord, help us to be able to uh, take these things to heart. Lord, that you be glorified and honored in all that's said and done. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here in our midst that does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, help them to understand uh, the things that are said here today. Lord, that you be glorified in all that's said and done. In Jesus' precious name we pray and for his sake. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. The effects of keeping unity. You know, all around us we see ele electricity working together. Or at least we see the effects of it. Amen. Uh, in this room, for instance, there are lights up here and there are lights out there that are working. There are also uh, outlets, a few outlets along the wall and then the outlets in the back there and outlets up in the front here and on the side uh, that uh, are working as well. And if you were to plug something in, uh, you would definitely uh, uh, see what happens. For instance, you turn the light switch on, the lights uh, uh, come on at the same time. Uh, you know, you don't see uh, you know, a few lights, you know, uh, glimmer or, or trickle, uh, you know, coming on, they all just, as soon as you flip that switch, they're on. Unless, of course, you got a mercury starter or something like that, then it might, uh, might hear a, you know, kind of a buzzing sound, but uh, eventually they come on and, and they're pretty bright. And then we uh, see how we can plug into any one of the outlets, have power to run a vacuum cleaner, uh, the sound system, as I mentioned, or anything else that needs to be plugged in, you can plug those things in and and they run uh, just as easily. <coughs> but in the same sense, there'll be evidences, or rather effects, that we uh, that are seen as we uh, uh, are unified together as a church. When we begin to see unity, uh, others will see the effect of that unity. So in the message today, uh, we will see the effects of unity and what happens when we do our best to keep unity in our church. First of all, number one, we need to realize our measurement. Our measurement. You know what he said here in verse number 13? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Sometimes you need to ask yourself, Christian, who are you trying to measure up to? If you're trying to measure up to Pastor Hallett, you're going to fail. You know why? Because I never measure up to what my expectations are. You're surely not going to measure up to me either. But you know what? If you try to measure up to Brother McCoy, you're going to fail every single time too. Because I'm sure he has expectations and, and uh, desires in his life that he would say, you know what? Uh, you know, nobody can meet these expectations. And we could go through every single person in this room here today, but... Our measuring stick should not be other Christians. If your measuring stick, by the way, is the world, then you would look, uh, you know, number one, your standards would be pretty low, but uh, when you measure up to the world, you look pretty good. You know, uh, you don't uh, smoke, you don't chew, you don't run with girls who do, and hey, that's pretty good, amen? But that's not what our measuring stick is. We're not to measure up to the world. 
Bible even tells us, uh, you know, not to be like the world, and and uh, uh, for they're contrary to God. When we measure ourselves, though, according to other Christians, again, uh, we according to some, we won't look so bad, and with others, we may look a little tarnished. I want you to look with me in 2 uh, Corinthians. Keep your finger there in Ephesians. We'll come back to it here in uh, just a moment. But look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And notice with me uh, verse number 7. It says, Do ye look on things after the, what? Outward, what? Appearance. Appearance. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? You know, people began to look on the, uh, a lot of Christians especially, a lot of people look at the outward appearance. You know, you can, you can wear, I've said this before, you can wear a, a three-piece suit. I don't think we have anybody that wears three-piece suits here. But uh, if you did, this message is not against you, all right, wearing the three-piece suit. But you know, you can wear a, a suit and tie, you can uh, have the you know, biggest smile, you can carry your Bible, by the way, really high, amen? <laughs> carry it around, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a Christian, amen? But you know, that doesn't make you more spiritual by you carrying your Bible a lot higher and wearing all that. By the way, I appreciate those of you that do wear the suit and tie. That's not what Christianity is about. It's not what we're to be looking at. We're not to look at the outward appearance. And as I said, a lot of people look at the outward appearance, but they cannot see the heart. The Bible talks about this in 1 Samuel chapter number 16. As Samuel, the, the prophet, he was watching uh, the sons of Jesse go by, and of course he first saw the first son, and he thought, oh, you know, this must be who the king will be. This will be the next king. And of course, uh, uh, Samuel was uh, excited about that, and then the Lord spoke to his heart. He said, no, no, don't look at the outward appearance. You know, he's, I'm paraphrasing it, of course, the Lord tells him, you know, uh, uh, man looks at the outward appearance, but God look at, at the heart. He said, now, I'm looking at his heart, and that's what I'm trying to find is somebody that's going to, with his heart, follow after me. Of course, we know later on that was David. But many will see what's on the outside and not know what is really going on in the heart. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter number 17 and verse number 9 and 10, I mentioned this uh, uh, particular passage, I believe it was Wednesday night. Turn there real quick, like, if you will, with me. Jeremiah. Chapter number 17, and verse number 9 and 10, it says this, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, what? Search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Man will always see things on the outward God is looking um, at things that are inward. And God warns us about measuring and comparing ourselves amongst ourselves. Notice in 2 Corinthians again, chapter number 10, and verse number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 12. For we dare not make ourselves of a number, nor compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves... Are not what? Wise. Wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule that which God hath distributed to us, and measure to reach even unto you. That measuring stick, of course, is Christ. So let me ask you this. How do you measure up to Christ today? If we were to put your life on a measuring stick and, you know, say Christ is up here where the cross is at, spiritually speaking, where do you measure up there? Is your life, are you, 
is your life exemplify Christ? Are you more like Christ today than you were this time last year? Are you more like Christ today than you were five years ago? You see, as you're unified together as a body, the more like Christ you'll be found. Well, number one, we see there our measurement. Our measurement. Number one, our measurement. Number two, we see our maturity. Our maturity. Notice back in verse number 14 and 15. It says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. No, our church theme this year has been grow. Taken from 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 18. God desires that each of us grow. He desires that every Christian grow spiritually. God does not want us to, to remain babes in Christ. He does not even uh, want us to be a bunch of just children. Amen? God wants us to mature and grow to the point that we can recognize that which is good and that which is evil. He wants us to be able to recognize, notice what he said there back in our text, he said that we henceforth be no more children. You know, it's amazing, kids, you can tell them uh, some things and, and they believe it, hook, line, and sinker, don't they? Right? Why? Because that's what a child does. A child, you know, just believes in almost anything and everything. And then you come along and, and you tell them uh, something else, and, and uh, you know, they can believe that as well. But, but as they grow and, and mature, then they realize, oh man, mom and dad were lying to me about this. Amen? Or you, as an adult, recognize when somebody's lying to you. Or hopefully you do. Amen? Sometimes you can tell when somebody isn't being uh, entirely honest. But you know, we as Christians ought to be able to recognize that which is good and that which is evil. Turn with me real quick like Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter number 16. And notice with me, if you will, verse number uh, 17 and following. Says, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, for they are uh, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. You know, Paul was writing there to the church at Rome, and he was telling them, hey, I, I would rather you, you have an understanding, you have a, a maturity, have a, a time where you've grown to the point where you recognize that which is evil, but you also recognize that which is good. And you can discern between the two. You see, God will send things along in your life so that you can grow and mature. The testings and trials in life are there meant to help you to grow spiritually. If there's no resistance, then there can be no growth. So are you maturing? Are you growing spiritually? Have you had growth in your Christian life? And maybe in the last year or last five years, or if you're an older Christian, at least have you matured at least some? And have you at least gotten to the point where you've realized, hey, I, I need to continue to grow. Amen. We see there number number two, our maturity. Number one, we see our measurement. Number two, we see our maturity. Number three, we see our makeup. We see our makeup. Notice in verse number uh, 16, if you will. It says there, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, 
according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <coughs> you know, we are all different, aren't we? I'm glad there's not another Tim Hallett. Amen? <laughs> as far as, like me, I know there's a Timothy Hallett, the third, amen? There was a Timothy Hallett Sr., but as many of you, and as some of you knew my dad, you know that I'm not like my dad. There's, very, you know, there's some things that are different. There's some things that are similar, but uh, there are things that are different. I, for instance, my dad was shorter. My dad was 5'8", if I remember correctly, 5'7", or 5'8". I'm a little bit taller than my dad, amen? <laughs> My dad had a uh, uh, smaller frame as far as, uh, uh, you know, build. I have wider shoulders than my dad. My dad had, I don't remember what size feet, but it was small. I have ten and a half elevens. You know, that's, that's my feet. My dad, he was shorter and smaller, amen. But then there's some things that I learned from my dad, and and that have been helpful to me. I've, I've uh, uh, you know, because of my dad, I am who I am. There was some influence that my dad had in my life, and, and it's caused me to be the pastor that I am, the husband that I am, the, the, uh, the father that I am. But you know, we're all different parts of the body that Christ has fit us together here. Notice back in what it said there in verse number 16 from whom the whole body fitly joined, where? Together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Turn with me real quick like 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. We looked at this uh, particular passage here. Uh, I'm not going to rehash all of it during the Sunday school hour this morning. But I do want to point out some uh, points here, uh, picking up in, in verse number 23. It says, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon, which, uh, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely uh, parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given uh, more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there be no uh, schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now are ye the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary, uh, secondarily uh, prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gift, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. You know, he was saying here, uh, and uh, Paul was telling the church at Corinth, he said, hey, uh, just so you know, there's, there's some parts that are going to be lacking. But those parts that are lacking, there's going to be other parts that are going to be helping those areas that lack. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but our diversities are what unify us in purpose. We have uh, very different, uh, uh, different demographics that are represented here in our church. But you know, our doctrine is what unifies us in plan. Amen. We come from different backgrounds. We have different testimonies. You know, there was uh, uh, some folks that could say, hey, I just got saved yesterday. But then there's some folks that could say, hey, I got saved 50 years ago. 60 years ago, just within our congregation here. There are some that could say, you know, I've been saved for, for uh, 15, uh, 15 years, and there's some that could say I've been saved for five weeks. But you know, God has brought us together. 
We have Christ in common. But we must be different. We must be the person that God created us to be and not try to be someone else. I don't want a bunch of other little Pastor Hallets running around. Amen? I want you to be what God created you to be. I want you to be the individual that God wants you to be. I want you, you know, if we have, uh, you know, I mentioned it this morning, you know, if uh, um, I had a, a hand coming out where my ear should be, you know, and it was doing all kinds of things that would distract you from what I'm talking to you about, you'd be paying attention to my hand and, and uh, watching it, you know, do all kinds of funny things, amen? It's like, wait a second, Pastor, what would you say again? <laughs> right? But you know, I have an ear here, and it's do, to do its function, and and work properly. <coughs> Excuse me. And I have a hand, and or two hands, and and they're supposed to function and work properly, and, and my uh, two feet, and so on and so forth. And if those parts don't function properly, you're going to have a problem. Think about this. A couple of weeks ago, some of you remember I had a kidney stone. Boy, was that painful, amen. <laughs> My kidneys were not functioning properly at that time. Amen. It really hurt. Caused a lot of pain. Amen. Think about this. When you're not functioning properly, you can cause a lot of hurt here at Birch Street Baptist Church. You can cause a lot of pain. Amen. Are you willing to say, hey, Lord, would you help me to function properly? Lord, you created me to be what you want me to be, be able to make up this body. Lord, would you help me to be the best me I can be through you? Well, we see there, number three, our makeup. Number one, we see our measurement. Number two, we see our maturity. Number three, we see our makeup. Number four, we see our mind. Our mind. Notice back in our text, if you will. By the way, this is our last point. Number four. Notice back in our text in verse number 17 and following. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as truth is in Jesus. You know, as you begin to be unified, and unified especially in doctrine, and, and God begins to speak to your heart, God will begin to change your thinking. As a Christian, if you're here today, by the way, if you're not, if you're not saved, God can change your destination. He can change your thinking as well. If you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know this, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Amen. He did that because he loved you. But then he not only died on the cross for your sins, he was buried and then he rose again and he lives today. To give new life to you. Jesus is the only way. It's not the Baptist way. It's not uh, you know, any other religion's way. It's God's way. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the only way. But you need to realize that God wants to change not only your destination, He wants to, wants to change your desires. He wants to change your mind and change what you think upon, what you dwell upon. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians real quick again. In verse number, uh, chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 1. And notice with me in verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. <coughs> you know, God wants us to have one mind in purpose. <clears throat> he wants us to have the same desire, same, uh, you know, realize that uh, we're to be perfectly joined together, he said there, uh, in uh, the same mind, and, and say, hey, you know what, we're here for a job. Mm. Amen? Yeah. Sometimes we get so uh, wrapped up in the problems that we have, we forget why we're here in the first place. Mm. We're here to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Right. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And then we're here to disciple, to teach others to do the same. Amen? Mm -hmm. Everything else is just icing up on top and, and the cherry. Amen? <laughs> but in order to do that, notice with me real quick, like Philippians chapter number one, in order to have the mind, the same mind, we need to have somebody else's mind. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Philippians chapter number one. And notice with me, if you will, verse number 27. It says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Realizing, hey, God wants us to strive together, amen, work together, having the mind of Christ. In uh, Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 5, it says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. You know, God desires for us to have the mind of Christ. You think about this. When Christ was on the cross, was he thinking of himself? No. no. When Christ was here on the earth, when he was hungry and thirsty and desired uh, uh, food, was he thinking of himself? No. Every single time Christ was doing something, he always had somebody else in mind. When he went down to Samaria, the, the uh, disciples, remember in John chapter number 4, they're like, hey, we got to go to McDonald's because it's uh, we're getting hungry. It's getting close to supper time. We need to go to McDonald's, uh, Jesus. We'll be right back. They come back, they've got food, and uh, they say, hey, we got some food for you. And Jesus said, hey, I have meat that you know not of. They're like, oh, did somebody get, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A for, uh, for, uh, for Jesus? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> like, wait a second, uh, somebody else picked something else for him up. And he said, hey, no, 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 I'm here to do a work. Amen. That's what, he, that's what we're here for. Too often we forget why we're actually here. We get to uh, thinking the wrong kind of thinking, and, and we need to have the mind of Christ. Christ was always concerned about souls. Christ was always looking to please the Father. Christ was seeking to do the work that God called him to do. This is the mindset that we need to have. That we need to be concerned about souls. That we need to look to, uh, for ways to please our Heavenly Father. That we need to seek to do the work that God has called us to do. And we, would, we will be able to accomplish more for God when we're unified doing what He's commanded us to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Turn with me to Matthew chapter number 28 and we'll close with this. Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. Notice what it says there in verse number 18 and following. Matthew chapter number 28. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye. That's you, and that's me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. 
Let me ask you this. Are you doing... Do you have the mindset? Is everything that you are doing to the point in your life where you're following and obeying the commands of the Lord? You see, your mindset ought to be such that you say, hey, I'm going to obey God no matter what. The effects of keeping unity. Let me ask you this. Your measurement. How do you measure up to Christ? Your maturity or your growth. Are you growing? Are you growing spiritually? Our makeup. You see, we have Christ in common, but we need to realize, hey, we need to be unified. We have different backgrounds, but we have Christ in common. Then has the Lord changed your mind and your thinking? Are you being affected by keeping the unity? Let's bow our heads for prayer. If you head bowed and your eyes closed, a little bit looking around. I'm going to ask just a couple of quick questions. And then I will have a hymn of invitation. I want to invite you to come and talk with the Lord. If you're here today, you say, Pastor Hallett, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure if heaven's my eternal home. But I'd like to be sure. I'd like to get a seven. Pastor, in this brief prayer, would you pray for me? Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up and slipping back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Yes, thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? Thank you. I see that one as well. Pastor, pray for me. God's for me in my heart. Would you pray for me? Anything else like that? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I simply want the privilege to pray for you. Pastor, pray for me. I don't know if I'm saved. Would you pray for me? The other question is this, then. Say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I realize, though, I don't, I'm not measuring up to Christ like I probably should. Or you say, Pastor, I've been measuring my life compared to other people. I've been even thinking about Christ as far as how, how well I measure up to him. Maybe you'd say, I realize I haven't grown a whole lot lately. My maturity isn't what it should be. Or you realize, boy, my makeup, I, I realize we're different, and because of those differences, differences it, it's okay. You say, boy, in my mind, I, the things that I think about, the things I dwell upon, are, aren't very Christ honoring. God spoke to a heart about one of those areas, or maybe some other area. <coughs> You'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me? God spoke to my heart during the message today. Would you pray for me? Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up and slip it back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Yes, thank you, and thank you. Thank you. I see these hands over here, and this one, these ones there in the middle. Thank you. This, these ones over here on this side. Thank you. We slip them down. I see that one back there, and this one over here. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to my heart. Would you pray for me? Yes, I see this one over here on this side as well. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. I see this one up here. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God spoke in my heart. Anybody else like that here today? In just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. If God spoke in your heart, I want to encourage you to come. Won't you come? Won't you come? Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts. Bless this invitation time. Lord, I pray you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone stand